Good afternoon and welcome to The Take-Up. Today we have episode 114, Vintage Value, Styles, Stitches, and Segments. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Uh, we are happy to have you in to talk about vintage. And here's the first thing I'm going to say. As soon as I posted this stuff, I talked about doing vintage embroidery, and the very first thing that I heard was, okay, define vintage. What are you talking about vintage embroidery? And one of the commenters said, and I will go ahead and kind of repeat without saying who the commenter was, uh, immediately they said, hey, I learned how to do digitizing for machine embroidery in an era that was stitched by stitch in the 80s. What do you mean when you say vintage? So we're going to talk about all of that. <laughs> what I'm going to say first, these are my experiences. If you are someone who sells vintage clothing, vintage apparel, who trades in it, who is mired in this concept of the vintage apparel world, you probably know more than I do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the definitions that I usually find, but I'm also going to talk about the stuff that people bring to me and have brought to me over the years under that heading of vintage. And I'm putting the scare quotes on it now. You're going to see me do this repeatedly as a hint to the style they were trying to achieve. And we'll talk about all of that. So not only are we going to talk about what vintage means and maybe what it means properly or what it's usually defined as, but I'm going to talk about stylistic cues, different ways that people define vintage and what a customer might be saying to you when they say, I want a vintage look or vintage appeal. So we're going to talk about that all across the board. So it's not just a specific style, it's not just a specific period, though we'll talk about the different periods that are possible in the time zones and what people think is vintage versus antique and what have you. We're going to talk about the kinds of things that people have brought to me over 20 plus years of doing commercial embroidery and helping people with designs, saying, hey, I want to work with this vintage piece. And some of the categories stylistically. Why did I call this episode the way, way I did? The title being Vintage Values, Styles, Stitches, and Segments. That's because I have had different vintage styles. I have had different stitch types and different kind of hints as to what you can do in your digitizing and embroidery itself, as well as materials to make something look different than common modern machine embroidery. And when I'm talking about segments, it's also certain segments of the design language. It's certain kinds of design, certain segments of the decoration industry that people have this tendency to mean when they say vintage, or at least has come up either through retail kind of inspiration or through other areas as to what a vintage piece might be. And often, and I'm gonna say this again later, often this relates to how embroidery has been popularly used over the past hundred years. Because uh, we'll talk about that again, as far as those segments. But when I say vintage, this is not me saying, oh, it's specifically machine embroidery from this period of time. We're not saying that. What I will say is that there are other kinds of cues people go to. There are different kinds of stylistic cues we can see in our designs that tell you when something is vintage inspired. And we can talk about how to achieve some of that stuff and what it means. So a wide ranging episode. I'm going to say it's going to be a shorter episode today. I know I say that sometimes and then go long, but hopefully this will be a shorter episode. Unfortunately, I've got some reasons why I need it to be a shorter episode today if possible. But I think it'll be interesting to discuss. I would like to hear your opinions too. If you've got customers who come to you looking for vintage styled embroidery, what does that mean to your customer? What are they asking you for? And what did you produce? So I would love to hear that stuff. So, you know, let me <laughs> let me talk about that though. We'll, we'll have some more to talk about. We'll have some more to discuss. I will show you lots of pictures and examples and show you different things that modern companies are doing that I can I consider vintage. And uh, we'll talk about these, these kind of periods and these eras and what this stuff means. So all across the board, we'll have that discussion. I'll be happy to take comments on that. And if you have something you wanna say, about vintage embroidery, things that look vintage, what customers have wanted, please chime in. From now, let's go ahead and say hi to some of the people who are in the live stream. By the way, if you are hashtag replay squad, by all means, we still want to hear your comments. We're happy to have you. But folks who are in the live stream, get direct questions and answers. So let's start with Jeff. Jeff Fuller is here from Fuller Embroidery Works and Embroidery Nerd and Adam from BJJHats.com, who has a really cool video out recently showing him doing his work. Uh, hello, they say. Hello, Jeff and Adam. Cindy King in from Texas. Good afternoon, Cindy. Frank is in from the UK. Thank you for sharing, as you always do, Frank, and getting people ready for the Threducation this Friday. Uh, Mike says, hey, 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 happy to have you in. I know you've done some cool vintage patch style work before, sir. Fanny is in from Belgium. Happy to have you in. And Mike says, I'll be right back. Got to go make that GMC truck patch. I already did a reproduction of that GMC truck patch you're talking about. If you guys are watching on the video, you will see 
in this initial setup right here, right in the center by my head in the channel <laughs> thumbnail. It's that GMC truck patch. That is my father's patch from his hat. He was a mechanic and uh, absolutely had that real patch. And that is his patch from his hat. And I did reproduce that for him at some point, as well as make a vintage inspired piece, a jacket back based on the original design from that era. So yeah, uh, like I said, the, these are all part of the things that we do for vintage stuff. And uh, Curtis saying, good afternoon, good afternoon, Curtis. Brian Bailey, creative and brilliance in saying, I'm feeling vintage these days. Yeah, me too. Now that uh, my youth is firmly in the vintage category, my high school years are now firmly in the vintage apparel category. I'm certainly feeling it too. Uh, Yusta says, hi all, when they say old and when they quote pre-1990, I'm from 1962, so that hurts. Yep, that happens. <laughs> like I said, we're gonna talk about those numbers again too. Uh, Mike says, you can't do a short episode. We know it. You know it. Just embrace it. I will try my best, but uh, problems at home mean I got to get back to the house and probably not play with embroidery as much as I want to. Lisa says, me too. I assume feeling vintage as uh, this gray bearded man is starting to feel right now. Uh, Jenny says, evening from a vintage Regal celebration in the UK. Yes, indeed. Indeed. We got the big celebration going on over on your side of the pond. Adelina is in. Uh, also, we have uh, Akin Louie in from New Nigeria. Happy to have you in as well. Hopefully, I did okay with your name. Uh, Deborah's here listening. Thank you. Mike says, that's so awesome. Badass patch of the story. Yep, I will tell you all about it. Jeff says, vintage club. Yeah, vintage club. A lot of people here vintage for sure. <laughs> Barb says, hi, Eric. Happy to have you in, Barb. And Lena says, morning, Eric. So good morning where you are, Lena. All right. Let's get into it. Let's talk about what vintage is. And first thing I'm going to do is just say, yep, yeah, we talk about vintage values. One of the reasons I talk about vintage value in that title is that doing something that has vintage styling can have an increased value to certain customer bases. One of the things that is always going to help you in your marketing is setting yourself apart. You don't want to look like everybody else's work. Yes, we want to have quality that is commensurate with everyone else's work, but when we're trying to get creative clients, we have to put out creative work. One of the ways we do that is not having our, our treatments, including our stitch styles. So we're talking about stitch types, we're talking about the way we put designs together, we're talking about the way we interpret art, not be something that's on the average that everyone else is doing. And one of the things we can do where we don't have to go out into you know the wild blue yonder on our own is to look at previous styles that were used and are no longer current. Some of those things, those vintage styles, can be uh, quite attractive, quite useful. So vintage style has value. But as I said earlier, I'm going to keep referring to vintage with the big scare quotes on it, mean, meaning that we're not always going to be talking about something that is uh, literal or to a specific definition. Uh, like I said, vintage doesn't always mean the same thing to all people. And most certainly, it doesn't always mean a certain time period or a certain era. That said, let's take this into kind of the vintage apparel space. If we're looking for a technical definition, if we're looking for something specific and we're trying to specifically tie down what is vintage, I'm going to look to the apparel space for this because if you just look at vintage in general, the, the word vintage has to do with wine. Of course, vin, right? We're talking about wine that's talking about an age of wine, a particular vintage. When was this made? When was this bottled, racked, put away? That's not what we're talking about. Vintage apparel, however, tends to refer to a certain time period. The thing is, it may not be as far back as you think. It's kind of surprising. I think that a lot of times people think it's going to be quite far back. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, it is not nearly so far back as you imagine. In fact, vintage, without the quotes, vintage in the vintage apparel sense means more than 20 years old more than 20 years old. So for all of us who were feeling vintage before, uh, you're going to feel especially vintage now because clothing, apparel that's 20 plus years old can be considered vintage. So yeah, what does that mean to us right now in 2022? Clothing pre-2002, uh, so pre the early aughts is now vintage. So right now, you know, get out your crazy town t-shirts, uh, you know, get out your odd stuff. And definitely all the stuff that I remember from my high school years in the late 90s, that's going to be vintage now. My Nirvana shirt is very much well ensconced in the vintage stuff. My Soundgarden gear is absolutely ready to go onto the vintage rack, no problem. So the first thing we have to say is, yeah, 20 years is vintage already. So yeah, I see everybody die in here. Lena is rolling in the aisles. I agree. Jenny says, that's half my wardrobe. Yeah, you may be holding on to vintage apparel that you don't even know about, right? 
So vintage apparel now is pre-2002. <laughs> so yeah, let that sting roll over you for a minute. But the actual definition for vintage for vintage apparel generally tends to be in the range of 20 to 100 years. Why do we go so far out as 100 years? People are saying, really, 100-year-old apparel? Now, number one, I'm going to tell you, yes, I have seen uh, denim. I've seen jeans that are in that really deep range of you know decades-old denim that's still being worn uh, or that is worn again, especially we're going to talk a bit about what it means to have something as dead stock versus just pre-owned vintage. But 20 to 100 years is vintage because generally uh, things beyond 100 years, even if they are extant, if they exist and are wearable or usable, are going to generally be considered an antique. Anything over 100 years is going to be in the antique range rather than the vintage or retro kind of range. Retro tends to be a stylistic cue we use. Vintage often when you're talking about clothing really is that 20 plus year old place, right? The funny thing is a lot of us who grew up thinking of vintage clothing as being 70s because we were you know, in the late 90s. We were in high school and vintage clothing for us was 70s, early 80s stuff. Uh, obviously that concept, yes, that's still vintage stuff, but now so is, you know, Chinko jeans and grunge t-shirts. Those are also in the vintage category. So those of us who know those things are going to be uh, seeing that move up a little bit and understanding it a little differently. But the other couple of things I do want to talk about, we're talking about vintage apparel, because vintage apparel is often where these embroidery concepts come from. Vintage apparel and very distinctly vintage patches. Patches and hats. I'm going to talk about them a lot because they are things that exist and are often laid up as what I'm going to call dead stock. Well, and not what I call, what everybody calls dead stock. But I'll talk to you about what dead stock means if you're not a collector. Like I said, those of you who are patch collectors, you guys know this lingo better than me. Correct me if I mess up. But I'll tell you what we did, what we call dead stock, what we called pre-owned or new old stock, and what did that mean, right? So if we have vintage clothing, it's 20 plus years old, we, and we can put the quotes on it, but here it's not really the quotes. This is the 20 plus year old clothing. There's a couple different things that we could have here. We may have either pre-owned clothing. This is something that someone has owned or potentially worn. We don't, this doesn't necessarily say how much wear is on this clothing. It just means that this is in the hands of a consumer. Whatever this was used for, if it was a given away item, because promotional products are actually a big part of this vintage kind of apparel look. And I'll talk to you about specifically kind of promotional products I see kind of being mocked in the modern era. But pre-owned just means it's into the hands of the customer and back to you. It could be in any other kind of condition. This could be something that is uh, worn and distressed. This can be something that looks like new. It just means that it got to where it is now through a consumer it's been worn used thrifted what have you it is something that came off of a person not out of a box somewhere in a warehouse that's pre-owned vintage some of the stuff that we see now and it's actually become more prevalent to seek it out i know i remember when this first started becoming a thing at least in, on my radar that i was always shocked that the stuff we had left over in a fairly uh long history screen print and embroidery shop turned out to be valuable down the road because what we had was something called dead stock, right? We had dead stock or new old stock. It depends on how you see it. I see dead stock more often. And that's what we actually called it internally uh, when we were talking about it. Dead stock is something that is no longer sold. So this is the concept. Something that's been pulled from sale and warehoused, stored somewhere, kept outside of circulation without having been sold and running through an end customer. So if we have dead stock or new old stock, and sometimes you'll see, especially with patches, you might see them uh, on a card or wrapped or in original packaging, very much like other collectibles. Um, you might see like new old stock on card, packaged, closed, sealed, what have you. But invariably, this just means uh, warehouse without having been sold. Something that has not been used, has not been sold, hasn't been uh, put to any other use. And honestly, when I say dead stock in the apparel sense, for decorators, the way we call dead stock, at least in the shops that I came up in, uh, dead stock for us was more about stock that uh, specifically had um, had been left on the shelves. We couldn't buy any more, whatever sizes were there because they are now not in circulation, but also usually not produced by our manufacturers anymore. So for us, it was the ends of orders. It was often older stock. It might not have been 20 years old, but it was often years old or several years old. And we called that dead stock. So that could be dead stock without being vintage, right? So if vintage is 20 plus years old, 
Um, dead stock isn't necessarily, you can have dead stock, which is just stuff that hasn't been in customer hands, but is currently out of circulation and no longer being sold. So yeah, warehouse without being sold. And funny enough, screen print shops and embroidery shops that have been around for 25, 30 years, and there are plenty of them, it's very possible that you may have dead ends boxed up on shelves from a previous era that are often, honestly, they may have a stylistic cue that is from a previous era, usually not 20 years, but sometimes fully vintage, you may not, right? It may not be 20 years, may not be vintage. And I'll also tell you this, you may have things from 10 years ago that a customer considers vintage because they refer to stylistic cues that were popular from 10 years ago. And that might be enough for the customer. Now we're back into the vintage with quotes on it. <laughs> now we're back into the vintage with quotes on it. If the person considers the era of the 2010s to be highly you know, interesting and nostalgic and wants a vintage 2010s hat and you have those in your dead stock they may consider that vintage and that might be good enough and we're not looking at those special apparel definitions so like i said it's not always the it's not necessarily having to have that determining factor yes you can but the the truth of the matter is people will come to you customers will come to you with different ideas of what is vintage and it may not be the ideas you have it may not be the ideas you have about that, right? So I, I'm going to go ahead and bring a couple comments things. We have some good ones and also some funny ones. And we're all about having some fun here on Fridays. We might as well have fun while we learn. Uh, Lisa Shaw says, now I feel old. I, I am with you on that one. Uh, Barb says, the vintage 70s are back with bell bottoms and stripes and smock tops. That has come back several times. I cannot tell you how many times I have gone back to learning how to put together um, folk style tops for the bohemian kind of tops the smock tops i have done that embroidery now in three different resurgences that's been around for a while uh, gina says i saw a post someone this week asking someone to make a retro design to be made for her without an image attached to the post there's no way to determine what she was looking for this right here this is what happens with vintage with quotes um what you have to do for this is absolutely ask for image source that is the now that we have the internet and the ability to search and capture things there's very rarely a reason why someone can't send a picture or you just stop and ask them the specific question. You stop and say, what does a vintage or what does a retro design look like to you? Most of the time, they'll come up with something that they're trying to say. And the funny thing is, sometimes you're going to find antiques. Because I actually had this, not recently, but fairly recently. Somebody asked me for a retro font. When I asked them what they wanted, what they ended up describing to me, they said, oh, like Great Gatsby. And I'm like, that is 1920s. That is probably Art Deco. The, the cues you're looking for were Art Deco style. They were not necessarily retro the way I was thinking. Because I'm first thinking, when I see here retro, for some reason, my first thought is like 50s, 60s. I'm thinking mid-century. Retro for me often ends up being that kind of like kidney-shaped blobs and antennas and cars with fins. That for me feels like retro because there was a lot of that going on uh, early in my career where there was this kind of resurgence of mid-century design. Uh, so I did a bunch of retro designs for people, retro jacket backs that looked like 1950s styled. Uh, honestly, they looked a lot like uh, old motel signs and signs from Las Vegas. I did a bunch of that stuff early on in my career. So retro hit that for me, but they were thinking 1920s. So you're often going to have to look for a reference. When someone says vintage or retro, it's really similar. You have to stop and say, all right, what does that look like to you? What is the reference to you? And then literally ask them for something pop culture. Uh, they may not understand it as pop culture, but say, uh, is there a book or a TV show or a movie or something that has the style you're looking for? What do you mean? If they really don't have any image, they can't be bothered to search Google, ask them for that because you may find everything from what we would consider antique all the way up. You may find somebody who wants like monograms from the 1800s and they're going to tell you retro or vintage. Because vintage technically doesn't have to be the vintage apparel version. It doesn't have to be the 20 plus years or 20 to 100 when someone says vintage, they can mean anything from a specific time period. And that's actually fairly, that's actually close to the kind of English definition. When we're talking about wine, when was it put up? When was it racked? What they're trying to say is something from a particular era, something that has the qualities of the particular era. However, like I said, I'm going to share some different styles of stuff that I've been asked for as vintage. So we can tell you more about that, but it's absolutely the kind of style we're talking about. And Gina is right. People ask for retro and they absolutely need to be more clear than that. It's good to ask. <laughs> Mike says, Jinko, wow. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm digging into the references today. 
Uh, Barb says upcycling clothing. Yeah, vintage clothing can be pre-owned thrifted clothing. And we're finding more people who are doing that and decorating on it, believe it or not. Uh, and as we've seen recently, I, I shared a news story about this to your guys the other day. Even retail stores, there are retail companies who make clothing who are starting to bring up, it's more current, it's not vintage, but they're bringing up their own stores to resell their clothing. I know REI, now REI is an outdoor company, but they're one of the people who have, who have retail stores that have resale in their retail. These things are coming around. This is a concept that's happening and they predict in the next five years it's just gonna increase. So it's still different though, it is still different. Brian says, to me, the defining item from 20 years ago was the AOL disc. Retro t-shirt design, anyone? Ew, let's at least go back to grunge. Yeah, I kind of feel that way too. Yeah, it really is. Um, it really is interesting. I think that's how that vintage kind of starts. And uh, Brian says, yeah, maybe it's when we stopped using English monarchy as our stylistic cues. And I mean, yeah, perhaps, perhaps. I don't know when the time is we start using vintage. I don't know. Suffice it to say, in my career, most of the time, uh, honestly, vintage stuff has been 40s and up. That's been my career. So so as far as my career has gone, in the time that I've been working at embroidery, at design, uh, vintage for me has been stuff from the 40s up. Occasional dips into Art Deco. Occasional dips into, honestly, Art Nouveau. Uh, early stuff, 1900s. But really, that that's the century. That's the century where I'm looking at. Uh, so that's about where we're at in most of my career. And frankly, a lot of retro, especially, was mid-century up, and it could be up into the 80s. But I really haven't had 90s until recently. Very recently, though, retro has started to include things like, um, you know, turquoise patterns and shapes and that kind of MTV aesthetic. That stuff has been happening, the turquoise and pink and yellow and the wild fluorescent colors. All of that is coming back in its 80s and 90s, and we're seeing more and more of that. But I still find when I have vintage being referenced today, and I'm actually going to show some really current references to what people are calling vintage, we're actually hearkening back to 40s and 50s again. It really depends on where you're at and what you're what you're looking at. But like I said, the word vintage doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. It means whatever someone decides it means, hence the scare, the scare quotes on it. And it may really refer to different things depending on what people are talking about. And funny enough, some people may be referring to not only you know these the 20 to 100 year old things, they may literally be talking about working with dead stock apparel, working with vintage apparel because, or working with pre-owned apparel. There may be a, a part of that because there's different ways we can come at vintage, right? And before going too far into it, I'll just say, these are kind of the places where we end up working with vintage stuff. It can be apparel focused and that can be either stylistic or literal. They want to literally use pre-owned or dead stock apparel, or we want to use apparel that's styled after a specific period. Um, I find funny enough, the Letterman jacket, even though it's current today, it really refers to, it's like, it refers to this kind of 50s ideal, you know, the poodle skirt period <laughs> that it may or may not have been real. It's actually the reference to it. It's probably Greece. It's like, it's the reference to it that we're actually referencing when we talk about that. But I've seen that. That's one of the things that we're talking about. Uh, it can be art focused, meaning the apparel is, is a normal modern piece of apparel. It's not part of the, the retro styling or the vintage styling. It's in the art. We want the art to look more like a vintage style, meaning we might be using typefaces that were common in a certain period. We might be using art styles that were common in a certain period, like a collage in certain periods was more popular. We might use a graffiti style that references 80s graffiti tagging in New York. We might, a place and a time period, we might do that in our art. It can be execution focused, which is what I'm gonna talk about in our embroidery where we may use different stitch types because at the time we're referencing a time period where hand guided stitching was more prevalent or where we're using machines like Meistergram machines that stitch all of their stitches horizontally. So what we essentially have are these vertical zigzag columns that we can kind of move around that might be execution focused in that way, or we could be doing faux chain stitch because we're replicating uh, chain stitch or Cornelia or Singer machines where people were doing um, they were doing manually moss stitch or chain stitch, and that was the common way that we were embroidering and personalizing things at the time. Uh, and it can also be materials based, where the kind of threads we use now are a little bit different than what was used earlier. And also people have thoughts about that that may or may not be true, where they think of things that are uh, fuzzier, they think of things that are rougher, that are less shiny as being vintage. And then the other portion of it, the other portion of it that makes this difficult is, 
is they might literally be thinking of something that is old in the way that it's distressed. I've had people return something vintage and what they meant was destroyed or distressed something that looks like it has wear and tear on it, as well as likely having some of the vintage inspired styles. So these are all things that we call vintage, right? So it's, it's a large constellation of stuff that can be uh, considered vintage and they can be part of this discussion. So it really just depends. I think I'm gonna bring up just some, some different stylistic objects, some things we can talk about and discuss what it means for them to be vintage. Some of the things that I, I uh, honestly have thought of in my own work or referenced in my own work or seen referenced. Um, and a lot of it, really common stuff you guys are gonna see. And I'm gonna show you also some modern examples of people using these. So we're looking at some vintage and dead stock. This is from a company called Hungry Ghost Press. But there is this entire kind of early 1970s patch craze that goes that gets done, where uh, you know we're applying a lot of patches to things, and we're seeing some of these. Some of these have some rude words on them and stuff. Sorry, folks, <laughs> if you're looking at the screen now and rude words bother you, then blink for a minute because some of these vintage patches have some stuff on you might not want to see. Also, these super classic name patch, and I'm shocked at this. I've seen people with vintage name patches that are actually from uniform companies that have removed them from. Uh, original uniforms. So there may be these laying around where people were reusing uniforms from a uniforming program and the original name patches can actually be sold. I've seen them in vintage stores personally, uh, big bags of these things because they were reusing the uniforms and taking off the name badges. So the classic name patch can be part of it, but often it's these, uh, these novelty patches are a big part of that. Um, We've also souvenir patches, and I'm gonna talk about that as a stylistic kind of setup too. This is one from Voyager, which is a company that's still in production right now making badges. So this is a very standard kind of emblem. It's made on polyester twill, and this is modern embroidery. So stylistically, as far as the stitches go, uh, that's not the big deal. This one is actually dead stock. So here in package dead stock, we have a, a vintage embroidered patch, and it's from that kind of era, that souvenir patch era. Here we have something from the Bicentennial, you can see still sealed, $1 souvenir patch, marrowed edge, classic embroidery. And this is really very modern looking embroidery to us. So this one stylistically, the execution of this, this patch does not materially look much different than the patches we have now. And I would say that the current patch movement that we're dealing with, that we're working through now, the patch hats we have now, really refers to this era. So this 1970s, early through mid 70s, honestly throughout the 70s, this patch era really influences the kind of patches that we're doing now. But there are some stylistic cues like these, this thick line design. And I'm gonna talk about that again in a second. So we have all of this stuff. We have, and this is once again, these are some slightly older patches from that same company, Voyager. Uh, another company is selling these. And these are, once again, these patches that were meant to be applied by yourself. They were iron-on. This is also the era of the iron-on transfer. And as you can see, these have a little wear and tear on them, but they're still in the package. And they are from the era of CB radio. This is the patch era that kind of, I think, leads to the era we have now through a couple of different stylistic cues. And you can see it's got some interesting kind of looks to it. And even if we look at some of the um, I would say some of the execution on this is interesting in that the stitch types are a little different and especially in the way we fill, the way we fill areas is the big one. Um, you aren't seeing as much to Tommy fill and that's something I'm going to talk about again when we talk about stylistic cues as far as execution. These were often done and I'm going to say a lot of this stuff is going to be point to point stitch by stitch. And some of the fills or a lot of the fills are going to be done with satin stitches overlapped. So overlapped satin stitches, more detail, more individual stitch placement, uh, stuff that you don't see as much now because it's so much easier to draw a shape and fill it with regular stitches. And because we aren't really doing singularly uh, planted stitches all the time. So we don't see as much of some of this texture work that's being done. Lots of shading on some of these really basic kind of inexpensive patches from the time. And also we have different uh, categories, like I said previously, and I'll actually stop and bring those categories up. Some of the categories that I see repeated over and over whenever I've done work that's considered vintage styled work, uh, I often get collegiate work, tons of classic collegiate work. And you'll see this in the retail spaces too. Uh, think Abercrombie and & Fitch and American Eagle, 
big block letters done in applique in multiple different styles and executions. Uh, the collegiate style work really just keeps coming back over and over again because it really often does reference earlier periods, even in its inception and execution. Souvenirs, which like I said, I'm going to bring that back up. Souvenir work, and this includes most certainly um, not only kind of the stuff that you saw earlier, which were the kind of statement patches, the, you know, keep on trucking patch that is endemic from the 1970s, but we're also looking at stuff uh, like what I'm going to show you in a second, which are national parks. We're looking at, you know, vacation spots, things like that, of uh, states that you might visit. The concept of these souvenir pieces, the resort wear pieces, uh, when they became very popular is in that same era as well. We're talking about these 70s and early 80s patches that can be uh, in that same kind of category. Souvenir patches certainly there. Pro promotional materials, I'm going to talk about these in a second and show you guys like seed corn hats, which really the patch hats we have now. And I would also agree that, or I think you would agree that the snap, the snapback flat cap mesh back truckers really refer to this era of farmers giveaway hats. So seed corn hats are a big place that that kind of comes out uh, and other kinds of farm equipment hats, tra uh, tractor hats, stuff like that. Those end up in that promotional space and lead to a bunch of the design cues. And then I've also seen a ton of militaria. So because uh, patches and emblems are heavily used in military applications, we're going to see that those old patches come back and the styles that are from those from you know bomber jackets on up so from you know 40s on up we're going to see militaria also represented as a stylistic cue that can be in vintage apparel and scouting once again where are the places that embroidery is being used those are the places we're going to be looking at for embroidery representation and for the kind of art style sometimes so these are all places that i kind of have seen this stuff pop up in my own career. This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So once again, here's another one of those dead stock patches from Voyager. And this is a Yellowstone Park patch. As you can see, lots of rough stitching in multiple angles and directions. These were very likely laid by hand. Look at all the weird little stitches and angles and directions in this piece. Even though we do have overlapping satin-like fills, all of this kind of geyser is rendered in different directions of stitching, very likely done by hand, stitch by stitch, manually throughout this process. So we have some interesting stylistic cues as far as the execution. Less fill stitch, more manual stuff, more satin-like fills. Even if you look into the trees on that piece, yeah, we got some reflections, we can't see everything, but we can certainly see that we've got some texture in there and none of this is done as a tatami flat fill over a large area. You're gonna see a lot more hand placement, right? And the same thing here, we've got another piece. This is a Yellowstone National Park, once again, vintage piece. So still in package, vintage iron on from Voyager. Uh, lots, of, lots of the Voyager stuff is out there. And you're going to see, once again, lots of manually placed stitches in all of these organic shapes that are here. And we have a little bison with this kind of satin-like overlapped bars of fill in this piece. So all of this stuff kind of helps you with the cues. The concept that, Filling an area wasn't done by drawing the outside edge and clicking go with the tatami stitch with a classic fill stitch or a basket weaver in those patterns. A lot of filling areas was done manually. Did they have tatami style stitches here? Absolutely. But you're going to see a lot more organic stuff, a lot more hand placed stitching, as well as, depending on the vintage stuff we're talking about, as well as manual hand guided embroidery that we then might be aping in our style. So we might be looking at someone who's used a zigzag machine, a sewing style machine and by hand embroidered a piece. And we might be aping some of the styles that come from that in the patches. So these are the kind of things we're talking about. And I'm going to kind of show you something modern that references those because I think this is fun. This is a company called the Midnight Society. And I love their stuff because it's just kind of fun. They have not really done as much with execution. But if we're looking at their patches, what I'm going to show you now is that these are pop culture references. These are not using the fill stitch styles. They're still using you know, tatami fills, the more modern, but we're really referring to that classic retro uh, national park patch. But here we're using uh, places that don't exist. We're using places from pop culture. So there's Rivendell National Park, obviously Lord of the Rings fans know what we're talking about here. 
Uh, if you're into Dune, there's Arrakis National Park, right? So we've got some fun ones there. Uh, uh, this is probably my favorite because it so much looks like pieces that I've made for wildlife reserves and national parks in my career. Uh, Isla Nublar National Park, if you're a Jurassic Park fan, you know what we're talking about. So the in-joke here is there. So we've used the styles, though, these classic styles of artwork, the classic styles of the fonts that are in here that refer either to those kind of third party. And I would say, uh, if you especially like we were looking up here at the Rivendell piece, this font style, this setup is absolutely giving you those vibes. It's showing you something from that kind of 1970s National Park patch era, but using it and subverting it with a modern twist. And on top of that, if we go to you know some of these other pieces, like the Isla Nublar piece, this looks like modern park signage to a degree. It also kind of looks like the classic National Park designs and font choices that you would notice as, as well as the color selections. We're using those stylistic cues to make something modern. And like I said, real fun stuff. Uh, if we look at look through some of these pieces, very simple pieces. And, and even in here, these fires are made with some nice satin stitch fills. Cool concepts uh, and really referring back to some of these ideas of these classic patches without necessarily uh, mocking them entirely or making a copy of them. So interesting stuff that we can do stylistically to make that work out. And like I said, we can do that and make things that are vintage inspired, right? So vintage inspired, in this case, these are vintage inspired because they're referring to a type of patch and a stylistic set of cues, but I wouldn't say that they have vintage execution. In that, uh, the materials are modern. These are made with polyester thread. They're made on modern machines. The stitch types are modern. They are using, you know, regular tatami fills. They're not using weird materials. They're not using uh, spun threads so that they're fuzzy. They're not distressing these pieces. These are vintage inspired in the art and in kind of the style of the piece they're using. You can almost say it's kind of like apparel focused because instead of apparel, it's an accessory that itself refers to that kind of previous style. So kind of cool stuff like that. It's just the kind of thing I, I, I like to explain, but you know, um, <laughs> I'll have to bring up some other comments and this is a, this is a fun one. So I'm gonna bring up something related to our industry here. Brian says, just looking at those patches brings my mind back to Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise, Breaker 1991, LOL. Yeah, absolutely, right? Uh, it The CB era. And so I'm actually gonna bring back one more little reference that is actually a little bit of an inside reference for our industry. If you guys haven't heard of uh, Coleman Schneider, Coleman Schneider wrote a book that a lot of us know called The Art of Embroidery in the 90s. In fact, I don't have to use this image to show you because here is uh, a copy, the, the green screen's kind of killing it, but this is a copy of The Art of Embroidery in the 90s, and it shows uh, all sorts of things about uh, the embroidery industry, the commercial embroidery industry and what it looked like from its inception up until the 1990s, including things like uh, a old school digitizing board and things about embroidered emblems. So Coleman, he works in embroidery and wrote about embroidery. However, what people may or may not know <laughs> from Coleman Schneider is that he also wrote a book under the name Coke Schneider. And when he did so, it's called the CB Lingo Bible. So this is something that is available right now. And if you look at this, uh, Brian was just talking about CB Lingo. Here we are, uh, this CB, so you know, Citizens Band radios that were big in the 70s check out all of the patches that he had he was selling at the time with the lingo from the cb check all that stuff out on the cover of his book for the cb lingo bible and this is the era we're talking about that gives you the classic vintage patch so when i look at these pieces though and you can kind of see it even from this kind of bad zoom in we look at that piece where where it says watch for bears on this one right watch for bears meaning uh watch out for the police who are going to get you where you're speeding that bear has uh, satin fills overlapped. That is not just a big tatami fill stitch. It's not a classic fill. And you're gonna see that a lot of these do use these um, satin overlapped fills instead of just the tatami fill that we all kind of know and love. There's more of that layered satin fill. And you can actually see, which is awesome, on the back of his piece, and I just have to share this, the back of the book that uh, Coleman wrote, that, Coke Schneider wrote, he was also selling iron-on transfers for people who did a CB stuff, who are CB enthusiasts. So as you can see, really cool stuff. This is 1976 for Coleman. And you can see here's him selling his patches as well in the book. So he was selling patches as well as doing his own stuff, writing the CB lingo Bible. So fun kind of stuff to know off the topic, but that does give you a, a concept, like I said, of all of these patches and
styles that were around and how they led to things and continue to lead to things like uh, the stuff that Midnight Society is doing. And Brian's been so good as to put this up for us in the comments. Uh, the Midnight Society US is where you can find those if you want to uh, support them and what they're doing. The cool thing is this is not the only kind of vintage we're seeing. We see stuff like this. Here's another one that we're very we we're really familiar with. I thought I would show you the classic hat that we were talking about, the snapback flat build hat really comes out of these corn like seed corn farm hats. This is something that was really common. And I remember when I first started embroidering, you could not sell somebody like five panel and six panel truckers uh, that had this big flat patch on the front. That was just not something anybody wanted. It was seen as out of date, out of touch, out of style, and people were not using them as much. It was stuff that we had as dead stock to the point that when we saw the first big trucker craze, kind of the Von Dutch era trucker craze in my career, we had meshback trucker hats that were dead stock that were on the shelf that we couldn't sell if we wanted to that suddenly became hot commodities. And if you guys have been saddled with trying to sew patches on hats in the last two years, with lots of people have, you can kind of thank the vintage seed corn farm hat for that. As you can see, this one doesn't have a mesh back. It does have a plastic uh, snapback strap. This is, when I talk about the promotional vintage style, this is one of the promotional styles that I'm talking about. The classic, you know, five or six panel hat, usually a high profile hat that has the big frontal patch. Um, if you know anything about design and people who are popular in design around the screen printing industry, you've probably heard of Aaron Draplin, right? If you didn't get to see him, he's taught at ThreadX. He's been at all sorts of stuff for SGIA. He's been to tons of places teaching around the idea of design. I was lucky enough to see him uh, when I was out at ThreadX. And if you look at uh, Aaron Draplin as a, com like, as a common thread throughout of all of his pieces, he uses those thick line styles. So if we think back, and hopefully I can get back to it without flipping you through too much stuff, we think back to this. This is 1976, this is the bicentennial, this is the kind of design work that's being done, these nice thick strokes, these thick lines. Aaron Draplin really references that stuff really heavily in his work. And if we look at his hats, so these are modern hats coming off of the line right now. This is stuff that he's putting out there. These are his design cues. I don't think it is at all hard to see where he's getting his cues from. Now this stuff, a little more retro Western for the Way Out West hat. We look at like this Oregon hat, check this out. Big patches, bold lettering, thick line styles, mesh backs. This comes right out of it. And I, actually, if you look at uh, the rest of the stuff Aaron Draplin does, because he is also the person behind, um, he has notebooks. Now I lost the uh, field notes. If you've seen the field notes pocket notebooks, those are from Aaron Draplin and they are directly descended from giveaway farmers notebooks, little notepads with golf pencils, you know, the little bitty uh, pencils. That is the classic way that those were distributed. And if we look at any of the stuff that he's got here in his stack, so here's this popular modern designer, but very much referencing. And if you look at these, look at the Dayglo Wilds action caps here, referencing that heavily with these big, high profile hat snap back uh, with that big thick line style. And even in all the other design work he's doing, including his t-shirts, that is really being referenced throughout as far as the stylistic setup. But what I would say is if we look at some of this other stuff that he's done, this is where the execution is very close. This is where we really are making an object that is similar to the vintage piece. This cap is not that different from the cap that was out there. It's high profile. It's using similar materials. Sometimes they're a little more advanced. I would say certainly they're put together in a cleaner way. But if we look at these patches, these ones are some of them are more, more modern. The printed ones are a little more modern. But a lot of his colorways, a lot of his styles, these are absolutely things that could come from the era and it wouldn't look out of place. If this thing was roughed up in the back of somebody's truck and you pulled it out, washed it and put it up for vintage, you wouldn't necessarily call it out from the get go. You wouldn't necessarily call it out immediately as something that wasn't from the era. So this is something that really is not only vintage inspired in the execution and also kind of dictated by most of the design work he does. You're not going to see a lot of fills. You're not going to see a lot of modern execution because these big thick lines really do lend themselves to that same kind of execution. Uh, and I think a lot of his patches, you look at these two, 
the patches are very much in line with that same kind of style. So throughout throughout his design stylings, you're going to find that same kind of stuff. But like I said, even if you just look at all the cards, the little rulers, the other stuff that he sells, a lot of these things he sells are really straight out of the promotional products world, but they reference an earlier era of promotional products. They reference that kind of, like I said, the seed corn, the tractor hat, um, that really is where he's coming from and where most of his stuff comes from. And he is not the only one. There's a ton of other logo designers and uh, graphic designers who reference that same kind of stuff and I think have a lot going on. You want to see more of this stuff? There, You can see there's other, other stuff in that range. But you say vintage embroidered patches on, on Pinterest. Pinterest is a great place for people to put stuff. Yes, tons of ads that are up on screen right now, unfortunately. And you're going to find some stuff that is not vintage. But you're going to see tons of this stuff where it's it's the the souvenir hats. So we have places you could visit, the travel kind of visit stuff. We have the um, we have old corporate work. We have stuff that is promotional, and we have certainly what I would consider appliques things that were sold as appliques to be applied to garments in fabric stores. If you're a kid with a mom who sews. You have seen a rack of on card applique items, and they are often. Um, free floating they look a lot like what we consider free standing lace designs these days like this lamb here and those are still in that retro vintage kind of style as well but these patches often in this right here little vintage embroidered pieces that are on cards from the fabric store that triggers a ton of memories for me and all the rest of these pieces all come from those eras right a lot of those eras being referenced throughout being referenced throughout the kind of vintage stuff you can find out there to look at. And what I want to say about this is every time somebody tells me, I kind of don't know where to go with this or styles, we know what a stitch is. If we can get a decently zoomed in picture of any of these things, we can reproduce them. We know how to make a satin stitch. We know how to overlap satin stitches. We know stitch types. We know densities. We know sizes. If we can get a random measurement and take a good look at one of these pictures, we can crib some styles. We can see stitch types that are being used. We can look at stitch lengths and compare. So one of the things I want to recommend to everybody who wants to do vintage styled work is go look at vintage pieces. Go look at original pieces, get some into your hands if you can, and you'll be able to find out more. You'll be able to learn more about them. But part of what started me on this entire kind of journey through all these vintage pieces uh, is actually this. And I'm going to talk about these in a couple different ways. This is more into the kind of 40s, 50s travel piece and the hand guided stuff. And actually, Brian Bailey, who's here in the comments, absolutely knows what I'm talking about because I've seen a piece that he has of this same era, of the original era from this. So what is this? This right here, if you've ever heard me talk about Super Dry, Super Dry is a modern streetwear brand. So brand new modern streetwear brand. This is a brand new modern piece that was released this year. If you go to what's new on the Super Dry website, this vintage Suika John jacket is in that segment. And it was one of the things somebody asked me about. They were saying, hey, Eric, I see this jacket with all this retro styling. I'm looking at these pieces. How can I achieve this stuff? Sorry about that, folks. Uh, yeah, how can I achieve some of these textures? I'm seeing these wild textures. It doesn't look like the stuff that I'm used to working with, right? I'm not used to working with these textures. They showed me specifically the sun that's up here and the mountains, and they're like, what is this crazy wild texture that they're using to fill this design? And this is where we get into a vintage style execution. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. But yeah, like Brian says, you gotta love those satin acetate baseball jackets. <clears throat> Absolutely. But what I want to show you is, though this piece that we're looking at, piece from Superdry, was absolutely done on modern equipment, done in modern digitizing software. If we're starting to look at things like the little uh, clouds that are up in here, these clouds are absolutely done in traditional satin stitch. They do not look like anything necessarily from an earlier era. By the way, everybody who gets very upset about a little bit of wrinkling and rippling in your designs, uh, this is a brand new $135 jacket. And uh, this is what their rippling and wrinkling looks like with the direct embroidery of this weight. Uh, give yourself more credit. <laughs> you don't have that much to be upset about. Um, if a super dry jacket can do it, you don't have to be quite as upset as you are about perfect flatness. But suffice it to say, heavy embroidered satin estate jacket, as, as Brian said too, is something that you can say, right? This is what they're doing, right? People were bringing back these jobs done. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and echo what Gina said. And this is absolutely true. 
Gina says, the guys coming back from the Vietnam War were bringing back jackets done free motion that were similar. Absolutely. And in fact, to kind of like make a make a case for that, uh, one of the things I talk about when we're talking about vintage styles of this type are the original jackets. This jacket very specifically is referencing jackets like this. So this is a jacket from Hawaii. So here is that souvenir style vintage. And it's a tour jacket, souvenir tour jacket, 1950s, 60s, Aloha Hawaii jacket. So this is from a vintage seller selling for $750, by the way. And this is selling right now on, you know, on Etsy from a vintage seller. But what we can see is we can look at this piece and see where all those stylistic cues come from. Satin, satin jacket, color block sleeves. We have the color uh, the color banding throughout. We have the decoration on left and right chest. We have a large decoration on the back. But as we start to look at these decorations, and I'll see if I can give you a little bit more detail on this, we can see that this lettering, you see how the lettering looks very calligraphic, done on a zigzag machine where up at the tops and bottoms of these loops, you're going to see, unless they turned the piece, it's going to narrow a little bit. And throughout, <clears throat> the fills are much more like satin, overlapped satins, because we're using a zigzag machine to fill areas, than they are like a traditional tatami fill. Also, the execution may be a little, it's like handwork, it's hand guided. Though it's amazing stuff, it's a little rough. Things aren't identical. One tree is not exactly the same as another tree. There is a little bit of handwork in it. So something we have to reference is the fact that everything is not entirely regular. And when we look deeply at some of the pieces here, and let's go ahead and take a look. Like I said, as far as we can in on some of these, we do have regular kind of filling in it, but it's something that it, maybe it could be hand guided. If it's not hand guided, it is still manually punched. We're not seeing a bunch of regular areas of one kind of fill. And the reference is to that kind of style where we're going to have something that is much more like overlapped satin fills. Now, certainly this piece is an original piece. It's got the damage to prove it. It's gotten up against something that was rusty. Uh, we've got a couple other pieces like it, but these styles are absolutely on show and being referenced in this super dry piece. Go back and look at the super dry piece again. You'll even find a piece that is in a very similar blue, right? We're referencing the art style. We're referencing the execution. And even when we get up into the stitches, heck, look at the super dry logo over here rendered in a faux chain stitch. And no thanks to the ads. <laughs> we do have a really retro style and we have retro execution as far as stitch types, once again, as far as renderings. So if we're looking at this piece again, like I said, some of the stuff that we're going to see is rendered in a way that is more like hand guided. However, unlike hand guided pieces, even as we're looking at this, background we're looking at this sun that's here it's very regular and the patterns are really regular in fact anybody who knows uh, digitizing software who knows the kind of styles of stitches is immediately going to say i recognize what's happening in that circle that circle is a standard satin pattern inside of the area right so let's go ahead and pop out to software for a moment here i am in stitch artist and what i'm going to say is this is a standard circle so here we have our standard orange circle filled in as you might expect. And that fill is in a classic tatami. We're at a four point density. We've got about a four uh, millimeter length, uh, 0.4 edge pads. So we don't have a lot of extra stitches out in that edge, 0.4 mils in. And that is what we're used to a large filled area looking like in most of our embroidery, right? Well, but without going to the other example, I'll go ahead and just stop it without changing anything else. We'll go to a null pattern. And doesn't this look awfully familiar, right? Doesn't this look awfully familiar to the stitches that we were looking at over here on super dry? Here's the piece on super dry. Here's the piece with the null satin pattern where all we're doing is repeating from the edge blocks of this four millimeter length. So blocks of the four millimeter length as we go through. Now we can change the length. We can change things about it to change how the execution is. But this is what we're looking at satin fill. So instead of using a standard stepped fill stitch where we don't have these strong patterns appearing, we have something like this. And throughout the pieces, you can be using either things like 
this is a satin fill. Now, by the way, I, I spent no time on this. I drew this freehand and I did a poor job, but I'm going to be honest with you and say, if you go back and look at this, if we look at the stylings of this piece that's in here, they were not trying to do pixel perfect, beautiful artwork. And if you look at some of the edges on these pieces, we have registration issues. We have all kinds of other things going on in here, but what we do have are novel textures. We don't have the regularity of a fill stitch and we don't have kind of the mechanical look of most modern embroidery, the ultra clean look. If you go back now after looking at this piece, even though it's not on a modern machine, and we look at even the stuff from Midnight Society. Let's go back and just look at Midnight Society stuff and we'll zoom into any of their patches. We'll check out any of their stuff. And you're going to see immediately that any of their stuff, like the little Isla Newbar patch we saw, look how clean and regular and tight those stitches look in comparison both to the super dry piece, super not that clay, not that regular. The patterns are wild. We have more of those satin lapping patterns instead. Or if we go back to the original vintage piece and we can go back to any of the pictures from it that we can get close to, and we're gonna see that a lot of that stuff really is a little more wild, a little more uh, loose and doesn't have those tight, tight stitches, doesn't have uh, that same kind of flatness that we get from a modern tatami fill. I would also argue on this piece that we're actually using thicker thread, probably different materials. So we could argue that that's part of it too. You could use different materials that were a little fuzzier. These are generally tend to be shiny materials, but this is probably, I would, I would assume is probably like a rayon thread. I don't know for sure. To me, it looks a little thicker. It could also be just multiple passes in each spot, but without the piece in front of me, I couldn't swear to it looks to me like a thicker thread but when we're into the super dry piece we're not seeing that thicker thread in the super dry piece it's pretty obviously standard modern embroidery thread it looks like modern embroidery thread like we would expect it to look so it's not as much in the uh in the material execution that we're getting that but we're certainly seeing those patterns we're certainly seeing stitch patterns that are much more like that satin fill or that null pattern that just repeats along the angle so here we are we've got that same fill pattern being used on um, just these really rough blocks of stitches with the angle changing, but allowing that pattern to kind of brick up as it does to end up in that kind of um, stepped pattern that is natural to filling that shape. Now, in this case, I haven't cut anything out. The one thing I am going to warn you about, if you cut out these individual pieces and the pieces that are underlying, uh, it will change the texture of this. You won't get the regular stepped pattern because as it steps down onto the narrower part of the cut out elements, you're going to end up with different patterns that you may or may not love here, right? You may end up with different patterns that don't look regular like this. They don't look regular like an entire circle of the same stepped satin pattern. And this is uh, similar in other softwares too. So if we go over to uh, Wilcom, this is a little bit different to how they execute it, but under Wilcom, it is called satin instead of being a null pattern. So tatami is that standard fill we're all very used to. If you go to satin, the standard satin one, it has some more offsetting. So it has some interleaving. Uh, the difference between the null pattern here is that uh, stitch penetration points line up more on the stitch artist version of this. If we're into the Wilcom version of it, of it we actually end up with uh, penetration points that are offset. So we get something that's a little bit like tatami uh, in the overlaps. It has a little bit of kind of sawtoothing that, that uh, fingers these two pieces together. So they blend differently. Um, whereas here you'll have a little bit stronger pattern depends on what you're working on, depends on what you're trying to achieve with it. You also could very easily, though with some time commitment, make your own version of this by creating your own satin passes columns that line up, overlap in order to fill an area. You guys have seen me do this before. The piece that I did for, um, for Heart of a Lion, that lion jacket back, the back of the lion's head is very much referencing this style. It's very much referencing the classic overlap style. I wish I had a better vintage piece than, than the modern piece here and a better vintage piece that doesn't have quite the same stuff. But we do have some roughness here, some feathering because of the natural piece we have. But that kind of filling by using multiple layers of satin stitch leaved into each other on the same angles with some angle changes for texture, that is similar and it references the same kind of style where we're filling with satins though I definitely use some textural cues to make it different. But yeah, like I said, it's that is something that's being referenced in this vintage style. And that is a modern, like literally it's released 
this season. This is a modern piece released this season that looks almost pound for pound like this piece from the 50s and 60s, and that still references the styles and the execution, the digitizing. The difference being is if this was just the jacket, you would see a jacket that looks like this, but with an embroidered background that had fill stitches in it with the design that looked very modern. And then that would be an apparel focused vintage inspiration. Whereas in this case, the inspiration moves out into the stitch types as well. It moves out into the execution. So like I said, there's a lot of different ways this can be looked at. Um, the other thing I I'm going to show you is that I've got a vintage themed kind of gallery here. And I'm going to show you some of the stuff that I've done where we had those references. And one of them was this stuff. This is These are both patches done for Vietnam veterans. And this patch over here on the right actually references an original patch that was brought in. It's not a perfect duplication. This is the original set with my patch on the right-hand side. What you can see about it, though, that is interesting, uh, what you might find interesting about it is that we do have the fills that are made of overlap satins. We are not very perfect about our, our the way we've lined things up. Certainly on the right-hand side, the piece that I made is much more geometrically perfect. It is much more refined geometrically than the piece, but you'll see I used very rough shapes like the original. I used satins and lapped them like the original. Uh, and we use similar color schemes and what have you. I will say, however, in the final piece, we end up using a 50% tatami fill background to create texture in the background of the patch. Whereas on the left-hand side, um, the entirety of the patch was created uh, with the original twill. And part of this is that that patch did have a rougher texture. That is something we did not worry about too much when we were making the, the uh, replica. And this is one of the later strike-offs of that same run. And as you can see, it does still have this kind of concept of looking like the hand guided original, looking more like kind of the roughness and the satin overlap setup from the hand guided original. On the left hand side, there isn't as much of that. What you can see that is interesting is we've used that ribbon texture in the background, which is overlap satins to fill an area. We still have some classic tatami fill here. What you will see is in the blending, I allowed there to be some more texture. And so these are kind of referencing in a small way some of that, you know, retro styling, some of that vintage styling. Other pieces certainly include this piece done for Sandia Prep. In this case, chain stitch was one of the references. The rough cut applique went to the other side of what people call vintage, which is distressing, a piece that looks like it has been worn or damaged. That because sometimes people are trying to reference a piece that is actually old physically. We'll pull back out of this for a second. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, but we have this piece, and this mascot is absolutely referencing an earlier cartoonish mascot that was not the kind of mascot look at the time. So we were using an old school mascot, and we're using the distressing, once again, to make this look like a piece that was older. So that can be another part of the vintage styling. Uh, this is one that I did for Keller Williams Realty. And we're referencing the letter jacket styling. And in fact, here we are for a realty company. We're using a classic letterman's jacket. So we're using a collegiate style with a true chenille patch. So the patch up here in the front uh, on the right chest is a true chenille patch that we had made. But on the left-hand side, these were small run patches made in-house that uh, though they aren't entirely um, kind of correct to the period of the era, they are very much like year-by-year uh, -year championship patches or award patches that you might see on a letterman's jacket. So in this case, stylistic and apparel kind of work and a little bit of the execution because we used real chenille instead of doing a chenille style piece or even just having a piece that was in this, this kind of positioning and looked like a chenille patch. We actually went and had real chenille patches made. Uh, by a, uh, the house that we would use for normal letter jackets. So that's stylistic, and they really wanted it to be more of a classic style letterman's jacket. And then we actually used a garment that is not a letterman's jacket. We used a retro styled, classic styled um, apparel piece from Sanmar that was made to look like a vintage letterman's jacket, right? Uh, lots of these things are are in the offing. And we showed this, earlier. this is my dad's actual patch from his hat. So this is a retro GMC trucks patch. One of the things you're going to see, if you see that central M that's in this piece, instead of having a solid um, a solid satin stitch or turning on this piece, we can see we actually have a split satin, two overlap satins here, and we're overlapping the satins and keeping them all running the same direction, the M to get that big thick M. Very different kind of way of handling things. Um, the fill under here is a little irregular. 
it is still a fairly similar to Tommy Phil. It's a regular, but one of the things that makes this one look interesting is the wear and tear. So this is the one where the distressing, if you wanted to get this, the original patch was probably not this distressed. It was the wear and tear. It was the washing and wearing by an actual mechanic who was running into stuff frequently and getting this patch roughed up that made it look like this. And I've had people ask me to replicate stuff like this. And instead of using the materials, they want something like a ring spun poly or not ring spun, a spun poly thread so that I end up with a roughness, something like this. Now, this one's pretty shiny, but this is a spun polyester thread being used with a modern design so that it looks a little rough. And if I use some feathering or some other techniques, I can make this piece look more like something that's had some wear and tear from a modern piece. Instead of having this shiny look like this rayon, uh, I could have either just a matte finish look like we have on this piece uh, with this bottom row all in the uh, matte finish polyester, or we go all the way to the spun poly and we end up with something like this. So yeah, part, part of it is it, we can distress things and the distressing can be considered vintage. And as I showed you guys a couple weeks ago, we talked about this texture Sometimes people consider this a collegiate piece that looks rough, that looks distressed to be vintage styled. But this is another piece that on the label, and this is me doing retail research, this is a piece that was considered vintage style. Why? We're referencing that original kind of seed corn hat style. We have a hat with a mesh back. Uh, we have a snapback, it's a trucker styled hat, and we have a piece that has rough cut applique on the front. And we see this rough cut applique here. Uh, we have some strings coming off of it. It is intentionally left loose. It is not uh, finished with a laser where you, we have like really clean edges, or if it is, it is being roughed up after the fact. We have it stitched on with straight stitches with a lot of border on this outside edge so that as this piece is worn, we're going to get more little trailers and fingers and pieces of frayed material. And the background is made of felt. And the idea of these felt patches, that's another thing that is very retro styled, is the felt back patch. Now, this one also has stylistic cues and thread usage that changes it. But this is a felt patch. And that felt style patch is often also thought of as a classic style. And in fact, just for reference, I'm going to show you guys what a less damaged version I actually found a copy of my dad's hat, or at least a very similar hat from a little bit later period of time. So this is a vintage GMC trucks hat, and this is what that patch originally looked like before wear. So sometimes when people ask us for the vintage look and they want the distressed look, it's not because we're replicating the piece. The original piece did not look like that. It looked white and red and clean and fairly shiny, even in the original piece. But after being worn, we get a piece that looks like this. We get something that has a little bit of patina, as uh, Mike said, uh, you can't buy that patina. It's earned, as Mike said. However, the other piece I'm going to show you is this. Up here in the top, there's another piece I did for Keller Williams Realty. And unfortunately, I don't have a great image of it. So I'm just going to have to show you guys. Uh, this is the image that I have. I can't get much closer to it. What you are seeing here, though, is something that you can buy immediately distressed. It references the collegiate style. And it is, I would almost call this more, more than distressed. It's destroyed. There's different levels of distressing. One of them sometimes people call destroyed. This is what I would almost consider a destroyed piece. And this is a piece we have for Keller Williams Realty directly from this, Stalls. Stalls produces something called distressed applique and is any word, any way. It's a custom cut template. We ordered these pieces directly from Stalls. I did design the piece myself that was designed on our end that wasn't designed on their end originally. Now, admittedly, it was using their assets, so it's very close to this stuff. But if we take a look at their piece zoomed in larger, they have different materials they can use. They have a, a sew file that you can use to attach it. And sometimes you can get these in layers or you get them pre-layered. And what I hate to tell you, this piece that I have here, pre-layered, pre-stitched and was put on with heat press. And all I stitched in the shop was the real T lettering underneath. And that was done in uh, traditional embroidery. However, I distressed the embroidery and had gaps in the stitching that were intentional. So that is a way where we use distressing to make something look like a vintage piece. And in this case, it meant pre-owned, worn, and used. Those are all ways we can call things vintage, right? So like I said, it, vintage means lots of things. So let's kind of reference some of that stuff. Let's go back to what we were talking about and kind of let you guys back into this concept. We'll talk about it one more time, just say, what do we mean? So when we're talking about vintage with a customer, when we're talking about vintage with a customer, that could mean a lot of things. Uh, vintage, let's put those scare quotes on it again, doesn't necessarily have to be one kind of thing. If we want to be super critical about it, 
The vintage apparel world usually considers stuff to be 20 plus years old, but that means the early aughts are fair game in the late 90s where a lot of my stuff was saved from is most definitely fair game. So yeah, 20 to 100 years is the vintage period for vintage apparel. However, it can mean all kinds of things. Yes, we can definitely have apparel that actually fits into this category. Could be pre-owned, something that's been through the customer's usage. It could also be distressed by that, certainly. Or we can have dead stock or what they call new old stock, meaning stock that is warehoused without having been sold. Those patches that are still in the wrapper, yeah, that that heat temperature adhesive may not be as good as it used to be. You might have to stitch them on, but you could use those. Or the apparel, if we have something that's not dry rotted, but the apparel itself is not damaged, we might be able to use old dead stock apparel uh, and do the same kind of thing. We could use original apparel that is in the dead stock category. Uh, for making our piece, that might be the vintage stuff. Or or we can be creating something that is vintage inspired. And the different ways that it can be vintage inspired, either could be apparel focused, the garment itself is a vintage style garment or a true vintage garment. So either it's some dead stock or it is a vintage inspired piece. So that means we're looking at a piece like that piece I showed you from Sanmar that looks like a classic jacket. It looks like one of the old satin jackets, looks like an old letterman's jacket, looks like something from a particular period. I would also put into this category, honestly, all the 80s and 90s wear, all the fluorescent shirts, all the stuff that references that particular period that has that style. It can be art focused. We can be making vintage style art that refers to a time period. The art itself, even if the stitches are very modern, even if the garment is very modern, we have a retro or a vintage inspired art piece. And that's all we go into. We just do the art. Or it can be any combination of these, right? Or it can be execution focused. We can be using different stitch types. We can kind of leave behind the modern tatami stitch and do more things manually. So more manual stitch execution, slightly rougher execution, uh, more overlapped satins, more satin stitches in general. And by all means, like I said, more manual detail, more shading that was done stitch by stitch, rather than things that are more mechanical and regular, like a modern tatami stitch, like some of the super clean work I showed you on the Midnight Society page. Though admittedly, lovely work. I don't I don't ever want you to think that it's a bad thing. The super regular work from Midnight Society, their stuff is very clean. I actually have a piece of it uh, that I, I purchased my wife, one of their pieces. I have it in-house and we'll take pictures of it because it's very nice, clean work. Uh, but execution focus means we're literally going to execute our design differently. We're going to digitize differently. We're going to use different stitches to make it happen. Uh, other things we can do to make something vintage styled, using vintage style materials. That could mean, like you said, distressing. It could mean felt patches, could mean, mean cotton or spun threads or rayon threads that are thicker. It, and by all means, it has some other appearances that can go with that. Um, but certainly materials can be part of that. But in that execution focus, it's also the focus on, on stitches. We're talking about embroidery here. It's the kind of stitches we use. It's the way that we use those stitches and it's how we also compose our images and part of the art. So, but the execution, I'm really talking about stitch types. I'm really talking about how we put our files together and then how, what materials we use can be part of that too. So what are we looking for when we're talking about execution? Like I said, use of the satins, use of less regular stitches, and think about aping some of the hand guided appearance. Think about looking at this as if we were guiding our machines by hand or using stitch types on hand guided machines. So that could also kind of range into the chenille chain stitch area, the faux chain stitch, the faux chenilles, that can be part of it. Or we can think about it as we were guiding ourselves a zigzag machine. So we have these fairly regular, slightly off kilter tubes of ribbons of satin stitch that we are guiding ourselves. And maybe the densities can vary a little bit because we are moving these things by hand. That's more of that hand guided appearance. We can also use uh, filtering, feathering, other kinds of hand guide or hand settings to um, apply a more irregular look to our pieces, randomization and infills if we do use fills, things like that. And of course the satin fill type that I showed you guys earlier, where we literally get that pattern uh, shape is really something you're going to see in modern references to that fill style because they're easier to apply. So if you're trying to get it to look like the super dry piece, we can just use a, a null fill, a none fill or a satin style fill to get that. But we can also, layer multiple objects together knowing that we're kind of aping, we're kind of mocking up something that looks like someone hand guiding a hoop underneath a zigzag machine. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Um, but by all means, like I said, this is up to the customer. 
this could just mean, when they say vintage, it can mean something that looks old, something that looks rough, something from a particular time period. Ask for clarification. Say, what does vintage look like to you? What TV, what movie, what reference are you trying to refer to? Is there a photo of something, a picture of something, a, a drawing of something? Is there an era you're looking for? Try and narrow it down. Vintage doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. Retro doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. And honestly, you will be able to get reference. We are luckily in an era where we can look at thousands and thousands of representations of what we're looking for. I wholeheartedly recommend you go out there and search for dead stock vintage patches, vintage embroidered jackets like the ones I just showed you. And anytime you have a zoomed in image, zoom into that thing and think, how with the stitch types and tools that I have now, could I represent those stitches? You have to remember, there is only one stitch. We only have a single point from where the needle drops once to where the needle drops the second time. All we do is stack those together in different configurations. Your digitizing software, your embroidery machine will make just about any stitch that any machine embroidery has ever done. You just have to give it the right input. And sometimes it means we have to decide if it's worthwhile to take the time to do things stitch by stitch, to do things one at a time. And when we decide to do that, we can get some incredible effects that aren't necessarily possible by defining an area, clicking an entry and exit point and setting one angle of fill. And even if we're doing that, we can use stitch patterns, we can use stitch styles like the satin style fill to get something that looks more like the stitching of that previous era. So look at some vintage examples, consume broadly, create with focus. That's what I say, look at all these different examples, look at some hand guided work, see what's interesting about it, see which direction stitches go, how long those stitches are, how close they are together, the kind of materials they use, the kind of combinations they put together for textures, and think about what you can do to reference those in your own art. And even if you don't like it in the execution style, you want a modern execution, look at the art itself, look at the color schemes, how things are laid out, how patches are used, what they're used for, and think about how your art that's being brought in by customers could be used in that way, how the art you're creating yourself can be changed to align with the kind of styles you're seeing out there. So like I said, uh, interesting stuff, something worthwhile, and hopefully something that may inspire you to do something cool later on. Um, don't stick to the standard vintage kind of definition. Use what you want, look at things from another era and learn something new. I promise it will add texture and dimension to your pieces. And what I'm gonna say certainly um, references to me, and I'll give you one more little bonus extra before I leave. One of the reasons I think I do satin stitch work as much as I do is from a piece of souvenir embroidery that I saw all the time when I was a kid. Uh, my mom had these sent from one of her family members, one of her sisters. Uh, these were Spanish postcards. Spanish postcards that were hand embroidered. And I actually wrote a piece about this. And I'll put this, if you want to see the pieces and you want to learn a little bit more about it, I'll go ahead and throw this into uh, the comments. Go ahead and check that out when you have a chance. This is a set of Spanish postcards that were hand embroidered on top of a printed postcard. And as you can see, look at these textures. As much as they are simple and only in a couple of colors and done with loose stitches, we have these awesome stitches. We have these great textures. We have directional use of the way light plays off of the stitches. And they aren't flat angled fills. They follow the curve of the body. They create fringes out of loose individual stitches and we get service sheen and texture. And this piece, these pieces, like I said, I wasn't dreaming of being an embroiderer when I was a kid. My degree is in English and medieval studies. I didn't think this is what I was going to do, but these were around me as a kid. And I think if we look at those, and then we look at the piece that I won my first ever digitizing award from, the Sundari Imports piece, I think you can see that some of this stuff had an effect on me. Am I still using uh, fill stitches in this piece? Absolutely. Am I following lines and curves and looking at this stuff? I think that's true too. And if I look at this piece and then I look back, you know, from here to those uh, stitched pieces that were hanging up in my house when I was a kid, which my, my mom is uh, very nicely gifted to me in my later years, uh, I now have these uh, in my own possession. You can see how the concept of texture and thread was something that got into my head. And I'll say this, it might have been kind of by osmosis since I never really thought about it. But I think if you look at these other vintage pieces that we discussed throughout, if we kind of, and yes, even the modern vintage pieces, 
we can get an idea for the texture that's available and you can do things like distress your own pieces this is a bomber style set of pieces from a company and they distress them to make them look like they had to wear a tear you can look at these big thick line designs you can look at the old seed corn hats and see how they were put together you can reference these styles check out these vintage pieces and honestly uh, for the prices some of them go for you can grab a couple of them up and have them in your own collection so these are things that are interesting i think it's always good to look at the previous eras of stuff that's possible and stuff that's out there and learn from them and learn from uh, folks like coke schneider <laughs> so in any case get out there look at the embroider that's out there consume broadly create with focus and make something interesting and put some of this vintage styling into your own work make something different and stand out. All right, folks, with that, I'm going to go ahead and finish the take up for this week, but I can't wait to see you again next Friday.